Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless isaiah 44 6 through 8 thus says the lord the king of israel and his redeemer the lord of hosts i am the first and i am the last besides me there is no god and who can proclaim as i do then let him declare it and set it in order for me since i appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come let them show these to them do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. The Abraham Accords were a major accomplishment for the Trump administration in the Middle East. Now those agreements could be facing serious challenges because of President Biden's foreign policy. The White House team has some different plans for the Middle East. And as Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, they could weaken the United States standing in the region and help countries like Russia. When President Biden came to visit both Israel and Saudi Arabia, things began to change in the region as agreements for mutual defense between Israel and neighboring Arab countries began to fall apart. The security architecture publicly, at least, unraveled. Uh, it was canceled, and the UAE instead uh, is now trying to reestablish diplomatic relations with Iran, uh, as are some of the other countries. So it seems that they measured the United States' commitment to confronting Iran up, measured it as too weak, and are trying to come to some terms with the Iranians. Middle East expert David Wormser says the unwillingness of the Biden administration to present a credible military threat towards Iran puts the Sunni Gulf countries in a vulnerable position. Because alone, they really can't stop the Iranians. They can't defend themselves effectively against the Iranians. So they only have one or two choices. One choice is to try to grovel in front of the Iranians, which is the path they're beginning to show. The second path is to find a new strong horse, a new patron of power that can help defend them. In addition to the defense concerns, the Biden administration is also making a change to the Abraham Accords by reintroducing the Oslo framework for Middle East peace talks, by bringing in Jordan, Qatar, and the Palestinian Authority. But other countries don't support that idea. The uh, Saudis, the others, the other Arabs, they do not like the PLO. They do not like what they're doing uh, to, in, in various areas. So by forcing that back in, it actually threatened the Abraham Accords. Again, fortunately, I think the overriding interests of the countries are so strong that the Abraham Accords will, will survive, but it will not be with U.S. coordination. Former Special Envoy for the Abraham Accords, Arie Lightstone says, these Gulf countries are frustrated. And there is a feeling of, what are we gonna do for the next 26 months? Lightstone says, if the U.S. doesn't lead, other nations are waiting to take over. There's no coincidence that Putin showed up to Iran just as Biden left the region. There is a competition here. If the U.S. doesn't lead, Russia or China will. It's absolutely in our interest to lead. And those countries want to be led by us. They want to follow with us. They want to stand next to us. Mm -hmm. They don't want to sit next to Putin. They don't want to sit next to the Chinese. They, they're not interested in that. But if we're not there, the Russians and the Chinese are. Chris, there's a concept in the Middle East about the strong horse. How does it apply to what we're seeing now? It's really unclear to many in this region, like Israel and the Sunni Gulf states, that the U.S. will use its power. So in effect, the question that they're asking, will the U.S. be the strong horse? So some nations are already answering that question with their actions. That's making nations like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, sort of shrinking back to protect their own interests. That's why the UAE is trying to uh, <clears throat> reestablish diplomatic relations with Iran, since they're not sure if the U.S. is going to back them up. It's also making Israel making statements like they'll have to go it alone if they have to, just sort of like the uh, IDF chief of staff said last week. In the last days, Jerusalem will be the focal point of world politics as we read in Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, 
I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples, when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Scripture plainly tells us all nations, including America, will be gathered against Jerusalem in the last days. On the other hand, it's making nations like Iran, because the U.S. may not be the strong horse in the region, bolder because they don't think the U.S. will use its power to stop them. I don't understand why the Biden administration would try to change the framework for the Abraham Accords. We finally had something that was working, that was bringing peace to the Middle East, bringing peace to the, the region. Why in the world would they change the framework? Well, I think, Gordon, it goes back to what we talked about even uh, last week. The Biden administration seems to be going back to this whole concept of a two-state solution and wanting to include the Palestinians. Now, bringing the Palestinians into the Abraham Accords in the minds of some, like we talked to uh, earlier today, would be reversing the achievements of the Trump administration and the Abraham Accords. And the reason why, the Palestinian Authority sees the Abraham Accords as a threat. And so they want to undermine the Accords. So the Abraham Accords, uh, in, in effect, took away the Palestinian veto for more than 20 years. I'm sure you remember former Secretary of State John Kerry said in December 2016 that be no Arab country would make peace with Israel unless the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be solved. The Abraham Accords proved him wrong. Now the Biden administration seems to be going back to that whole concept of a two-state solution, bringing the Palestinians even into the Abraham Accords. And as Ari Lightstone, who we talked to earlier today, he said that would throw a wet towel on the Abraham Accords. God gives the most dire warning to the nations who would divide up his land, as we read in Joel 3, 1 and 2. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. What he did in saying, based on the 1967 borders, he has to know that's absolutely impossible. You can't have that. Israel could never accept it, and it, the, you know, the oddest thing is the Palestinians don't want a two-state solution. What they want is Israel off the map. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's foreign policy is pretty simple. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. We finally had a, an administration willing to stand up to the Palestinians and say, no, you don't get to bully us. You don't get to have your way. You don't get to continue to preach this ideology. We're no longer going to continue to fund it. And it now seems like this giant reset. Um, is this sort of the U.S. foreign policy establishment reasserting themselves or you know, what, what's behind the, the policy change? Well, I think a lot of people say it's the third term of the Obama administration, and uh, this was the policy of the, of the Obama administration. Now the Biden administration, many of the same players in both administrations uh, that, that are working right now with uh, President Biden to establish this foreign policy. And the whole idea basically uh, is simplified. They want to appease Iran. That's why they went back to the uh, negotiating with Iran over the Iran nuclear deal and going back to a two-state solution. That was an evidence last week when President Biden was here. He visited uh, Eastern Jerusalem without an Israeli flag on the car. Uh, he, he talked about a two-state solution, going back to the 1967 lines, uh, as you mentioned. So uh, that's what seems to be happening. The foreign policy that was there for eight years with Obama is now in the third term, as some people say, with President Biden. Well, let's talk about the meetings, Putin, Russia, uh, joining with Turkey, having meetings in Iran. Uh, it's, it's right out of the book of Ezekiel. You look at chapter 38 and you go, wow, I, you know, it, it, an alliance that's really unlikely is now coming together. So is there a possibility with war, uh, of war with Iran? And, and in that, is Israel really going to go it alone? 
Well, that's sort of the big question right now in the Middle East. It does seem more likely, not less, of a possibility of war. Uh, the reason for that is the U.S. is perceived as weak in the region. So while these nations are making their own decisions on their own national interests, uh, and Israel is saying they may have to go it alone. That's what the IDF chief of staff, Kohavi, said uh, just last Sunday. And that was following uh, President Biden's uh, trip. And so uh, as uh, Ariel Lightstone said in our report, no coincidence that Putin is in Tehran just a few days right after President Biden. They're making the statement that they say they want to be the strong horse in the region and, uh, and they want to have bolder uh, policies there in the Middle East, more uh, relations with Iran and Turkey. And uh, as you said, it does seem like a prophetic uh, perspective unfolding right now in the region. Ezekiel 38, 1 through 9. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes. Many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm, you will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that many people believe will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountain shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8 and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, 
You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin the infamous Gog of Magog that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last days assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Russia's ongoing war against Ukraine is resulting in Moscow putting pressure on Israel and that could possibly stop Russian Jews from immigrating to Israel. In a Moscow court, Russia's Justice Ministry moved to ban operations of the Jewish Agency. While foreign organizations have faced increasing pressure in Russia for years, threats recently ramped up. The Jewish Agency is responsible for worldwide immigration to Israel. Former Chairman Natan Sharansky, a Russian Jew and human rights advocate, helped clear the way for the exodus of two million Soviet Jews starting in 1986. Nearly 20,000 Russian Jews have immigrated to Israel since the invasion started, along with some 16,000 Ukrainian Jews. In Russia, he says, citizens are losing freedoms at such a rate, it's a reminder of communist Soviet rule. Pincus Goldschmidt, who served as chief rabbi of Moscow, couldn't return from a trip because he didn't support the war in Ukraine. He's now in exile. These are complicated times and uh, the many dark clouds on the, on the horizon also for the Jewish community. And this has been reflected in a great exodus of members of the Jewish community who have left Russia since the beginning of the war. Svetlana and her husband made Aliyah from Russia two months ago. We've hidden her identity to protect her family in Russia. We are very happy with that we made this decision. The political tension is rising and uh, the activity of Sakhnot is apparently being questioned at the moment by Russian authorities. Uh, not a lot of people can actually leave. Rabbi Goldschmidt says tens of thousands more Jews in Moscow with Israeli citizenship simply left. He expects the trend to continue. Isaiah 43, 1, 5, and 6. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Ever since the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, the Jewish people have been scattered all over the earth. One of the many signs we are living in the last days is the Jewish people would return to the land of Israel. This prophecy was fulfilled in the late 1900s and is still being fulfilled today. Hosea 3.5 Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Well, let's talk about the meetings. Putin, Russia, uh, joining with Turkey, having meetings in Iran. Uh, it's... It's right out of the book of Ezekiel. You look at chapter 38 and you go, wow, I, you know, it, it, an alliance that's really unlikely is now coming together. They're making a statement that they say they want to be the strong horse in the region and, uh, and they want to have bolder uh, policies there in the Middle East, more uh, relations with Iran and Turkey. And uh, as you said, it uh, does seem like a prophetic uh, perspective unfolding right now in the region. War is more likely. People need to be praying for the region and for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122.6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem means praying for Jesus' return, as he is the only one who brings true peace when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at his second coming. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness? forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith, and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's 
have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God. Our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. Occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready.